First Baptist Church of Carthage. It's great to see each and every one of you here this morning. Um, we welcome those joining us online. That's kind of the cool thing about being able to put this on YouTube and Facebook. You can watch it whenever you want to watch it. I know people watch this all throughout the all throughout the week. I think there's like 60 some views last week, which is pretty cool. Uh, we don't care about the views, but we care about the people watching this at home. We care about their hearts, and I love the questions and comments. So if you're at home watching this, or if you're here live, um, definitely you know talk to me about questions. If you want to know some scriptures, if you have a question on a scripture or whatever. Um, feel free to talk to me, very acceptable. I'd love to talk to you about this more. We're in a, a series, this is week seven already of our current series, Proverbs, Wise Words to Live By. And if you think back over the last couple of weeks, uh, we had maybe four weeks ago, there was a week that was pretty challenging, pretty convicting for a lot of us. And um, a lot of people afterwards were like, well, you were really talking right to me, you're hitting right in the chest. Well, that's, that's God, that's God's word. Like, you know, tapping a finger in your chest, it's not me, it's me reading God's word. And then the following week, we did a message called um, The Moral Benefits of Wisdom. And that was kind of an encouraging kind of like, this is what we get out of these Proverbs. And then last week, again, was another kind of convicting message. It was really strong, and I heard a lot of feedback that I really needed to hear that. I, this person needed to hear that. And I, I really hope that everyone's paying attention to that. It was another really convicting message. Well, this morning, uh, week seven... Um, it's entitled, More Benefits of Wisdom. We're going to be reading Proverbs 3, Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. That's our main scripture. There's a couple other scriptures. I'm going to let you jot them down as we get to them. So, for the last six weeks, we have been discussing wisdom. Because that's what the book of Proverbs is all about. Wisdom, wise words to live by. We were told how to get wisdom. By reading Proverbs, we were, we were told not to ignore wisdom. We were warned not to reject the wisdom that we're hearing. We were told that wisdom is all around us. We were warned about the enticements and the sins that, that will pull us away. And we were warned about the wicked and perverse people who have no wisdom. Solomon calls them foolish people. And we were told to seek wisdom as though we're searching for treasure. Talked a lot about that. And we were told about how many, we were told about the, the, the moral benefits of wisdom. And this morning we're going to learn about more benefits of wisdom. And how we can apply that wisdom to our lives today. So let's read this. There's eight verses here. I'm going to read them straight through. This is uh, Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. We're going to read them straight through. My son, do not forget my teaching. But keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Verse 3, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and do not fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Blessed be the reading of the word. Let's, let's pray and then we'll really dig for some treasure in these scriptures. Father, we thank you so much for all you've been doing for us and all you do for us and all you are going to do for us. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your plan. We thank you that you love each and every one of us. Father, I pray that I pray for everyone that's here this morning. And we could have been anywhere, but we're here this morning for a reason. There's something that you have for us this morning. Father, I pray that we can all sit back, open our ears, open our hearts to your word. And then we don't just hear it, but we listen to it. And we allow it to sink into our hearts. And then we apply it to our lives today. We don't put it off. And we share it with those in our lives around us today. Father, finally, allow me to speak accurately and clearly the truth, the truth you've laid on my heart to share with this family this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go back and take a look at these eight verses that we just read. Okay, they are meant to be read in pairs. Okay, we just read these. There are four pairs of statements, four pairs of these if-then statements that we just read. Okay, in each pair of verses, Solomon gives us clear instruction and then he tells us what will happen if we obey. 
if then. We've talked a lot about that. So let's look at the first pair of scriptures that we came across this morning. This is Proverbs 3, 1 and 2. First, the instruction. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my command in your heart. Let's pause there. There's two instructions in that sentence. Do not forget my teaching. My son, my child, you, Christian, young person, old person. Don't forget my teaching, is what Solomon is saying here. Don't forget the truth. Don't forget what you're learning about God. Let it sink in. Think about it. Don't just hear it and walk away. Talk about this with other people. Talk about this with your family as you drive home. Talk about this around the table at night. Remember it, is what Solomon is saying. And the second instruction that he gives us really helps with the first one. It says, keep my commands in your heart. Keep them in your heart. Okay, don't just sit back and listen. Don't just sit back and say, yeah, these problems didn't really make sense. Like, somebody should really pay attention to these because they, they seem pretty wise. It seems like they make a lot of sense. Don't just sit back and listen to these. Okay, what does it say to do? Put them in, in your heart. That's an action. Don't just listen. Take some action on this. Okay, put some skin in the game. Put some effort into this. Keep my commands in your heart. Don't just listen. Take them from your ears. Put them in your heart. God knows we're human. Okay, he knows we're going to forget things. If you're anything like me, you will probably forget things. Okay, I, I tend to forget things. Um, you go on a trip somewhere and you might forget a toothbrush. You think, I just buy another toothbrush. You might go on a trip hours and hours, half a day away, and you forgot your backpack. Um, that might happen to somebody um, who gets busy with doing other things. Or, or maybe you forget, uh, you go away and you forget to lock the doors in your house. Or maybe you leave and you forgot to turn the coffee pot off. If anyone here drinks coffee. Um, maybe you forgot little things like that. Maybe you forgot your spouse's birthday or anniversary. If there's any reaction there. If there is, I apologize. Just forget I said it. But years ago, years ago, Tina and I, um, we uh, went to church, okay? We used to have to take two cars to church. That could be a lot of kids. We had four kids at the time. But I used to go to church really early, so... Um, I grabbed one of my older teens, my son or my older daughter, one of them. We would go into church early, and we would, like, shovel the snow. Like, this morning, if it needs to be shoveled, we'd set the cookies up, we'd make the coffee, pick things up, clean things up. Whatever needs to be done, we'd actually get the songs ready for, for worship. We would do whatever we could, um, behind-the-scenes type of stuff. And my, my wife, she would come a little bit later, and she'd bring the rest of the kids with her, and we would meet at church, and we'd worship, and then we'd go home, and... Uh, so we went home, and we're sitting in our comfortable chairs after church one morning, and around lunchtime, probably eating an egg sandwich, drink the coffee, whatever, and uh, it seemed pretty pretty quiet. It was a good day. We just kicked back. Like, Jesus, nice afternoon. All of a sudden, I get a phone call. It's a pastor, and he says, uh, are you guys missing something? I'm like, no, I don't think so. And he's like, how about your youngest daughter, Hannah? I'm like, oh, yeah. You didn't get her? I didn't get her. We forgot Hannah. And I would love to say that's the first time we left her at church, but no. Um, Tina reminded me we left her at church on Christmas Eve one year, and we rode together, so that's a little tougher to do on Christmas Eve, but we got her before we opened the gifts in the morning. No, she wasn't there that long, but we got her back. And it's not the only place, honestly, that we've left them. Say, we have four kids, you go to all these sporting events, you're going to leave somebody behind sometime. It just happens. Um, that's how we are. The point is that, that we're, we're human, and we do forget things. And maybe you can just relate to this a little bit better. Maybe you stayed up on an all-nighter. So you pulled an all-nighter studying things. Or you're cramming all this information into your mind um, to take the test in the next morning. You just fill your mind with these seemingly random facts that you know you're never going to use again. You really don't understand these formulas and this stuff. But you pack them in your mind anyways because you, you're going to have a test in the morning. So you just fill your mind with all this stuff. Um, and then you sit down and take the test and you just draw a complete blank. Everything you just crammed in your mind is, is gone. And uh, my son, when he was in high school, he used to, um, he would be able to uh, tell me the birth dates and the batting averages and the jersey numbers of every single Yankee. He could tell me every one, current players and past players, his favorites, he would tell me them as well. He could remember that stuff. Could he remember... Anything from school, like history, facts, no. 
we spoke English. He couldn't remember much about English. Um, and that's how it was. He was really interested in the baseball stuff, so it was really easy to remember what you're interested in. He wasn't all that interested in the names and the dates of things that happened in the 1600s. Um, I learned trigonometry and chemistry and Latin and calculus years ago. I wasn't all that interested in it. I'm sorry, Mike. He teaches calculus. Um, the majority of what I learned about those topics, I have since forgotten. Okay, how many of us learn things? How, how much this information do you really retain? You learn this stuff long enough to pass the test, and if you don't use it in your life, if you're not interested in it, if you don't really understand what you're reading, you're not going to retain it. Solomon's saying, remember the stuff that you're learning about God. Remember the truth you're learning about God because they're important. Because they, they're going to affect your life today. That's what he's getting at. And that's how we have to approach Proverbs. That's how we have to approach God's Word. Some of the stuff we don't use in everyday life, but some of the stuff we're going to, we've been warned about this. We all have the tendency to forget things, especially those things that are, are not important to us. But Solomon is saying, you have to see the value in this. And when you see the value in it, you're going to remember it. It's going to be easier to remember. If we see that we're going to be benefited in some way by something, we'll chase after it, we'll remember it. Like if, if I can... If we can gain something by remembering something or remembering to do something, we're probably going to remember to do that. We'll be more apt to grab onto it, let it sink in, remember it. And God knows this. So in the Bible, depending on your translation, there's about 250 times in the Bible where God says, remember this, remember me. Don't forget this. He says it in different ways. He wants us to remember certain things forever. Why? Because they're good and they're important and we need to know these things. He wants us to remember because it's going to help us in some way. It's going to help others in some way. It's going to help him. He wants us to remember him. He wants us to remember what Jesus did for us. So this morning, God is speaking through Solomon and he says, remember my teachings. Don't forget them. Open your ears. Listen. Digest them. Dwell on them. Discuss them with other people. Gather them up. Seek them like treasure. And then store them somewhere safe. So seek them up, gather these truths, store them somewhere safe. We talked about seek them like treasure, like silver or treasure, and then store them up in your heart for safekeeping. Put that buried treasure that you're finding, put it in your heart. That's what Solomon says. Why? Verse 2 For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Solomon gives us some benefits of remembering these teachings. He's telling us why we should remember these things. It's good for you. Your days, your life will be longer. Your days will be better. You'll be at peace. He didn't say you're going to be perfect. He didn't say your life's going to be perfect. It's going to be better, longer. Who doesn't want that? It would seem that these reasons alone would make us want to seek out God's Word and learn it and remember it and store it someplace safe like in our hearts. Are we doing this? Do we just come here and read and leave? Or are we reading this and studying it and allowing it? Are we grabbing it and storing it in our hearts? Remember the last couple of weeks we read, store it in your heart. Here it is again, put it in your heart. Store it there. So let's move forward. <clears throat> the, next, the next pair of Proverbs. Proverbs 3.3 3 is our next pair. Verse 3 says this. <clears throat> Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So let's pause here. Proverbs 3.3, 3, Solomon gives us three instructions. The first one, don't ever, don't ever let love and faithfulness leave you. Okay, think about that. Even on a bad day, don't let love and faithfulness leave you. Be faithful. Hang on to love, even on that bad day. Even when you're tempted, even when you're enticed, be faithful, hang on to love. Even when you're mocked by other people. Oh, you're a Christian? Ah, how foolish. Even when you're let down by other people. Even when you're cheated on by other people. Hang on to love and be faithful. And then Solomon says, in fact, tie love and faithfulness around your neck. Okay, think about this. So many of us, I'd be willing to, to say all of us, to some degree, have something tied around our neck, some addiction, 
Some guilt, some shame, something we've done in the past, something we just can't let go of. We all have something. Maybe something that somebody's doing something to us is just waiting around our neck like this chain, and it's holding us down. Now Solomon's saying, tie love and faithfulness around your neck. That will lift you up. If you have love and faithfulness that close to you, that's going to lift you up. It's not going to pull you down like this other thing that you're wearing around your neck. When love and faithfulness are tied around your neck, they'll be right there when you need them. A couple examples of that. One quick one we can think about. Help a fallen and I can't get up. Okay, you fall down and you have that, whatever it's called, the emergency thing. It's around your neck. Why? Because when you fall someplace, you can't move. You're stuck in that place sometimes. You, you need help right there. I can remember when I was younger, um, I took a lot of wilderness survival training. And... Um, Sometimes we'd be like hiking for weeks at a time and you need to have something in case of an emergency. So we used to make these little wilderness survival kits. They're about this tall. It was like a tube, kind of like a metal mat tube thing. I don't know what they are. They're about this big. I tried to find it. I could not find it. I can't remember where I put it. Um, but it's about this big. So inside of this thing, we'd make these, okay? Inside of this little emergency thing that we'd put on a cord and wear around our neck, in case we fell, we'd have the emergency stuff. In case I break my leg, I've got an emergency kit right with me. Okay, so inside this little kit, what's in there? A couple matches. That's only going to last for a couple of fires. There's also some flint and a little stone in there. And there's also some dryer lint that is really good at starting fires. Um, and there's also a fishing line and a fishing hook, just enough to sustain you and uh, stuff like that. Just a couple little tiny first aid things and you wear it around your neck in case you fall, you can't move too much, you can start a fire with what you have where you are. That's what Solomon's saying here. Tie this around your neck. What? Faithfulness and love. Always be faithful to God. Put it around your neck and love. Okay, in the verse, this third one is going to Send this home even a little bit more. The third one that Solomon says here, let love and faithfulness, again, third time he's talking about this, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Write them on the tablet of your heart. He's taking it up a notch. First he says, wear it around your neck. Now he says, write it on the tablet of your heart. Okay. There's a really cool, cool picture. We've been told to keep things in your heart. We've been told to store things up in your heart. Now Solomon says, write love and faithfulness on the tablet of your heart. Okay, when I first read this, I started to think about it, about the heart. And I started to pray about the heart. Okay, the heart is used all the time in the Bible. Okay, picture a heart. Okay, why would we use this all the time in the Bible? Just picture a heart, this organ. It's kind of this slimy, not really round, kind of an odd shaped looking organ. And it's not the most attractive thing in the world, but the Bible talks about it all the time. And just picture that you look into the heart. And this is what I was picturing. When you look inside the human heart, the way the Bible describes it is the inside of the heart goes on forever. It's got this vast space that can only be filled by the love of Jesus Christ. And people will try to fill that human heart with all these other things. That human heart represents your innermost being. And you're longing for, for something. People look everywhere for something to fill that heart. What they're looking for is Jesus. They don't know it yet. And that's where he's going here. Solomon says, write love and faithfulness on the tablet of your heart. So now I'm picturing this tablet that goes down into this vastness that just continues forever. And think about it. When the Bible talks about tablet, what do we think about? A stone tablet, right? Ten commandments chiseled into this tablet. That's what we think when we read this tablet. When something is written in stone, you can't change it. You chisel something in stone, you can't erase it. It's there. That's why we use stone on headstones. It's, it's there. And Solomon says, write love and faithfulness on the tablet of your heart as though chiseling it in stone. And there it will remain forever. That's a powerful picture it paints that we're taking God's word and we're taking love and faithfulness. That's how important it is. Chisel it on your heart so it's always with you. And I think it's interesting I still get people saying, well, that's all Old Testament. Proverbs, that's all Old Testament. <laughs> yeah, that sets the foundation for the New Testament. That's the knowledge that we're going to need to, to understand parts of the New Testament. So what are we talking about? Let's take a quick look at New Testament. 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. I think it's interesting. 3.3, 3, same numbers as the Proverbs one. But, so Paul is speaking 
I'm going to paraphrase a little, and then I'm actually going to quote him. I'll just give you a little background. Paul's speaking to Christians, okay, to the church of Corinth. And he's speaking to Christian leaders specifically here, um, Christians who have been down the road a little ways. And he, he's saying that the example of your life, you guys have been in church here a long time, the example of your life, he's talking to you and me, your ministry, your faithfulness to God, your love for other people, your life. Is showing other people, showing strangers that you are a letter from Christ. That's what Paul. That's what Paul calls us. He says that your life as a Christian is a letter. You are a letter from Christ. So the example of your life, your life has become a letter to other people. They're going to read it. They're going to view your life and they're going to see Christ based on what they read through your life. If you're the only Christian they know, you're the only glimpse of Jesus they've ever seen. So they're seeing Jesus through your life. Kind of scary. Paul says, this is the actual scripture, Paul says, this letter is not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Old Testament, New Testament, saying the same thing. You gotta love it. How powerful is that? As a Christian, you got to understand that other people are reading about Jesus through your life. They're learning who Jesus is through you. It matters what you do. Through your words, through your actions, through your behaviors. Folks are watching you. What are they reading? I included this scripture so that we can also see that Proverbs, that God's word, God's truth is bigger than you and me. It's bigger than us. We're not here for me, for you. It's not about us. It's so much more. Sure, we, we come here and we gain knowledge. And we gain the wisdom. That's how to apply the knowledge to our lives. That's all good. That's all what we're here for. It helps us. But this will help other people as well. That's what we've got to understand. We're writing this letter for other people to read. It'll help us to carry out the Great Commission. All these Proverbs. That's why we're learning the truths. That's why they're in our heart. So we can share them when we need to. We need to learn and apply Proverbs. And when we do that, that will help us share the love of Christ with our corner of the world. That's God's plan. I say this a lot. Church, church family, being a Christian, being part of the body of Christ, it's not all about you. Okay? It's not about your likes. It's not about this that you like. It's not about that that you like. It's about God. We're here to worship the Lord. It's about God first. It's about others next. And then it's about us. So Solomon is saying, if you hang on to this love and faithfulness, if you tie them around your neck, if you write them on your heart, then, Proverbs 3, 4 says, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and in the sight of man. So if you take all the truths, if you take faithfulness and love, tie it around your neck, Engrave it into your heart. These things happen. You win favor in God's eyes. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want favor in God's eyes? Who doesn't want God to look at you and say, I'm pleased with you? Well done. Who doesn't want that? You display love and faithfulness. You are going to impact those around you in a positive way. Okay. If you don't display faithfulness and love, if you display hatred and, and just your arrogance and self-conceited, no, one, no one's going to listen to you. No one's going to listen to the truth of, of God. You win people more, you can win people more readily for Christ when you're displaying faithfulness and love. These are good and valuable qualities to have when we go to share truth with people. So not only are they watching you, okay, we hear this a lot, somebody mentioned it two weeks ago at the men's retreat, it's a saying, you've probably seen it float around, it says, um, you get it right, when you share the gospel, you use words if necessary. Okay, that's a nice saying. That means there are people are reading the letter that you're writing for them. They're looking at your life. So share the gospel. Use words if necessary. Well, God's words aren't necessary, okay, for one thing. We, we live it out, but we got to be able to understand this. we got to know it. we got to apply it to our lives. And we got to be ready to share it with people with faithfulness and love. We're going to do it with faithfulness because we love the Lord and we love those people. And we got to do it in a loving way. And that's what we're getting at here. That's what Solomon's getting at. Um, faithfulness and love, it goes a long way when you attempt to carry out the Great Commission. Um, 
when I ran the outpost, real quickly, quick story. The outpost was this non-alcoholic Christian nightclub that we ran in uh, downtown Oswego. We had a lot of people would come in. They'd find out we're Christian, and long story short, some people just hate Christians because you're a Christian. And sometimes you can't blame them. Um, they Sometimes they learn from their parents who may have had a horrible experience. They may learn from the media. They may learn from some other place what Christians are all about. It seems like they think that we're just about rules and hatred and things like that. And so we would sh sh try to show them a different way. When people came into the outpost, they would come in to argue. They wanted to get in an argument with us. They would come in and they would say some hot button issue. They would confront us on. What do you think about this? And I, I would say, well, what do you, what's your opinion on that? Like, what are you basing your beliefs on, on that? On your feelings? On what you read in Facebook and social media? You know, how are you basing your your beliefs, and this is how I'm basing my beliefs. And I would say, and we show them the scripture lovingly. I'm doing it faithfully because God wants me to share this truth with them. I'm doing it out of love for them. So Proverbs is teaching us how to do this in a loving way. And then I would just say, this is what I'm basing my beliefs on. What are you basing your beliefs on? If it's feelings, it's going to change before the day is over. So that's one example of of how we're putting this proverb series into play. It will help us um, to, to share the good news. So. Let's keep moving. The next pair of verses, Proverbs 3, um, 3, 5. This is a very familiar verse. Here Solomon is giving us three instructions, and we're going to receive one result back. Okay, three more instructions, one more result. Verse 5, Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So Solomon is saying, put all of your trust in the Lord. Put your innermost trust, all your trust. Do you trust him in your innermost being, really? Listen to everything that he has to say, and then do everything that he asks you to do. Trust and obey. We sang that song in the first service. There's a line in, in, in Trust and Obey that says something to the effect of you have to lay yourself down at the altar before you can begin to trust the Lord. You have to lay down your own plan, and that's what's going on here. That's what Solomon is saying. Don't trust your, yourself. Trust God, not yourself. Don't lean on what you think you know. Don't think on what you feel is right. Don't make your plans or your choices or your decisions based on what you think you know. Don't make plans or decisions based on feelings or desires. Trust Him, is what Solomon is saying, not you. And then submit to what you hear. When God says, don't set a foot on that path, he means don't set a foot on the path. We talked about that last week. It's not a game. This is serious stuff. Don't say, no, nah, God's not really talking about this for me. Okay, this, this thing, this area of my life, this, eh, it's not really a sin. These guys do it. Um, I can handle it too. They seem to be handled. I can handle this. If God says, don't do it, don't do it. And then we think, well, he's not really talking about me. He's talking about those guys. I can handle this. Can the people watching you handle this? Can those in your life handle that? Can you really handle it? God says no. He, he says don't do it, don't do it. So that's what Solomon's saying here. He says trust the Lord. Stand on Him. Not on your own beliefs, not on your own feelings. In fact, Solomon says don't even lean on what you think you know, let alone stand on it. Don't even lean on it. Not a little bit. Seek the truth. It's valuable. And then do what the truth says, even if you don't like it. We all want to, at times, lean on or trust our own understanding. We all want to do that. We all, we all think that, I, I, I know better. I've been down the road before. I can continue to do this. We lean on what we think we know. We lean on, on what we feel is okay. At times, we will all try to rationalize this thing that we're doing. Sometimes we'll try to justify it. We'll grab the scripture, maybe and twist it and say, see, it's, it's not that bad. We lean on our own understanding. We lean on our own thoughts and feelings. Because sometimes that's easier than facing the truth. Because if we really face the truth, we've got to make those changes in our lives. When we submit to God, when we trust Him, we are actually, to, actually choosing to put His plan ahead of ours. And that's always a wise choice. You want to make a wise choice? Put God's plan ahead of your plan. Whatever it is you're struggling with, whatever it is that's going on in your life, is it God's plan or no? Is it outside of His will? Yes or no? 
and then stand on the rock, stand on his word, stand on truth, stand on Jesus. Don't even lean on what you would rather be leaning on. I don't care if it feels good, if it makes you happy or whatever, don't do it if it's not right. How often do we hear young people, and I'm not talking about like young people, but maybe, how often do we hear young people and teens, young Christians, young Christians could be 95 years old, how often do we, we hear people, or people who don't believe in God at all, they, they say the same thing, they all say the same thing, you and I, we, we said this, maybe we say this, not out loud, I don't really need God, not in this part of my life, I'm okay here, I don't need church, I don't need the body of Christ, I can do life on my own. I can learn this stuff on my own. I don't really need to, to come to church to learn this stuff. I don't need God's words in my life. Do we think that ourselves? Look at your actions. Do your actions say that you think that? You might be thinking, oh no, I believe in God. I trust Him in every, act, every aspect of my life. Just don't look over here. Just don't look at my phone. Just don't do this or that. Solomon is saying, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't trust in yourself. Don't even lean on your own understanding. In everything you do, submit to him, is what Solomon says. Do what he says. And if you do these things, then you've got to make your path straight. That's the result. You'll, if you want to get to the best place, we talked about it last week. God just doesn't want you in a right or a wrong place. He wants you in the best place. Okay, we talked about it last week. If you want to get to the best place with the least effort and the least amount of trouble, you're still going to have trouble. There'll still be some curves and some bumps and Something's wrong with the road ahead of you, but listen to God, follow Him, do what He says, and this will avoid many of those bumps and curves and pitfalls in your life. We see it all the time. A person chooses sin. A person chooses to live in sin. Maybe it's you, and then you wonder, why is my life so messed up? Why can't I just get out of this hole I'm in? Things just, just seem to continue to get worse for me. I know God says, don't do this, but I like doing that. I'll continue to do that, but not all these other things. And then we wonder why we just can't get over this home. So let's wrap this up. we got one more. We'll do this one quickly. Proverbs 3, 7, and 8, the last pair here this morning. Proverbs 3, 7 says this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. So again, Solomon's giving us three more pieces of instruction. If we follow them, then we can expect these two results. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think that you know it all. Okay, the truth is you don't. No one in here knows it all. Not even close. I, I like to say this about, I say this all the time. You don't know what you don't know. We don't even know what you don't know. There's so much stuff. There's so much in this Bible we have no idea what we don't know. Every time I pick this book up, I learn something new. Every time I pick this up, I learn something new. I read it. I dwell on it. I've been reading this book hard for over 50 years. I've been studying it. I've been teaching it for about 30 years. Yet still, I find new truths in this book every single day. We don't know what we don't know until you know it. Now you know it. It's like a treasure. You got to seek it. You got to dig for it. When you find it, you store it away in your heart. Keep it safe. You don't forget it so you can use it. When God says, I have this amazing plan for you, trust Him. Step out of the boat. Do what you hear Him say. And the, the key to this trust, okay, this is huge. If you don't remember anything else, you can remember this one, little, this one little sentence. The key to trust is humility. It's where it all starts. You've got to lay yourself down. If you're going to trust the Lord in one aspect of your life, you're going to have to lay down your plans. If you're going to trust the Lord in every aspect of your life, you've got to be humble and lay your plans down. Trust starts with humility. Be humble to the Lord. Lay yourself down. When a person young or old says to me, why well, don't I go to church? I've heard it all before. Or they say, I don't get much out of church anyway. All I can think of, are you putting anything into church? I've known people that have sat in church for years and years and years and they say, I don't really get anything out of it. I just go there because that's what I do on Sunday mornings. I don't really get anything out of it. Are you putting anything into it? Okay, this is not a spectator sport, okay? We're not here to just sit and be entertained. We're here to, to listen and learn and seek and grow and store truths away and apply them and start to help other people. 
help them learn. It's amazing when you turn around, when, when God pulls you out of muck and mire, when he pulls you out of a pit and puts you on solid ground, and when you turn around and you see somebody else dabbling in the, the same muck and mire that you just got pulled out of, it's amazing when you help that person out, that feeling you have. God helped you out, you're helping somebody else out that had the same problem. You gotta trust. The key to trust is humility. So when a person young or old says to me, I don't go to church because I've heard this all before. That's what I ask them, are you putting anything into it? Are you seeking? Are your ears open? Are you really listening? Do you agree with what you're hearing? Do you fight it at every word? Do you say, man, nah, that's not true. I know the Bible. I just read it in the Bible, but it's not for me. Do you say that? You can't. you got to be open to what you're reading. Your ears have to be open to it. Your heart's got to be open to it. It's not a salad bar. You can't pick and choose what you want. Do you think you know better than God? Is your heart open to what you're hearing? Or maybe your, your, your heart is hard. You can pray. You can read. Jesus can soften your heart. Maybe you're leaning on your own words. Maybe you're leaning. I've seen people do this too. People can come up with a hundred reasons. Okay, I've talked to people that say, well, America is doing church wrong. Or the worldwide is doing church wrong. Okay, I've heard this a million times from a million people. This farmer in Iowa says we should be doing church this way. Okay, so God's word is wrong. Jesus, the body of Christ, who Jesus is the head of the church, he's wrong. Paul and Peter were wrong for going around starting all these new churches and helping them stay focused on the church. Christians for over 2,000 years are wrong because some guy in Iowa that I watched on YouTube says we should be doing church from my kitchen table or from my couch or from a boat in the middle of the lake. You think you know better? You're leaning on your own understanding? You think you're special? You think you have it all figured out? Don't be wise in your own eyes, Solomon's saying. You think you can do church outside the body of Christ? Maybe you're thinking, you don't really need God. Solomon says, don't think you know it all because you don't fear the Lord, respect Him. Back to our first week. Fear the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. you got to have that trust. you got to lay yourself down. All of yourself, you got to lay it down. And then Solomon says, shun evil, stay away from it. Resist enticements. Stay away from the wicked people. Stay away from the wayward woman. Don't fall for the schemes that traps the world. Don't fall for the smooth words of wicked men. Solomon says, trust God, shun evil. Solomon says, you do these things, verse 8, you do these things and it will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Solomon says, if you do what I say, then you're going to be stronger. You'll be healthier. You will be built up, not torn down. Who doesn't want all these things? So a real quick summary of what we read this morning. Solomon says, remember God's teachings. Store them up in your heart. Hang on to love and faithfulness. Trust in the Lord, not in yourself. Fear the Lord and stay away from evil. Those are the things we read this morning. And then if you do those things, your life will be longer and better. You'll win favor in the eyes of God. You'll win favor in the eyes of men. God will make your path straight. Your body will receive nourishment and strength. Spiritual nourishment, definitely. The choice seems very clear. And it's all free. You can choose it. You can choose all this or you can choose to say, no thanks. No thanks. I would rather live a shorter life. I would rather not be prosperous. I, would, I don't want the favor of God. I don't want the respect of other people. I don't care. I want to wander aimlessly through life. I don't want to follow any kind of God's plan. I want to follow in pitfalls. I like it. I like the twists. I like the bumps. I like the crooked road. You can say that. You can choose it. I don't want to be nursed. I don't want to be strong. Well, normally to a normal, healthy person, the choice seems very clear. When we hear or see something good, that will make our life better and easier. That will help us to share the good news with other people. We will want that thing. Because it interests us. It will benefit us. It will benefit all those around us. And because God wants us to have it. And we'll do whatever we need to do to get it done. We'll take the action. We'll go read this again. We'll allow it to sink in. We'll ask other people, can you explain this to me again? And we'll share with each other. This is what God is saying here. 
And then we'll store that truth in our heart because one day we're going to need it for us and to share it with other people. So let's step back. And all of you know right now, I'm going to say, here's a couple questions. What will you choose? Will you choose God's word? Or will you continue to lean on your own? Will you choose God's word? Or will you continue to follow your feelings and your desires? Even though you know it's wrong, you continue to follow. How about in every aspect of your life? Whose words are you choosing? In every aspect of your life. Okay, 95% of my life, God, you got all this stuff. But this stuff over here is not hurting anyone. It's kind of fun. It's just every aspect of your life. Lay it down. you got to trust the Lord. You lay this stuff down, and amazing things are going to happen. Go back and read it. Just the eight verses we read this morning. In every aspect of your life, who are you trusting? God's word or your own? Last question. Something to think about. What would your life look like today if you really trusted God in everything rather than trusting yourself in anything? Every aspect of your life, if you just handed it over to God and just did what he said in every aspect of your life, imagine what your life would look like. Go back and read the eight verses again. What needs to change in your life? And no matter where you are this morning, maybe you find yourself right now, maybe it's just 1% of your life where you're still hanging on to something, but that 1% is that chain that's on your neck that's holding you in this pit, and you feel like you're just dirty and in this muck and mire. God's got something for us. Psalm 40, 1 and 2. This could be any of us speaking this. This could have been any of us in the past. This could be any of us right now wanting this. Psalm 41, 41 and 2. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me. He, he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. He lifted me out of the mud and the mire. He set my foot on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. That can be you. That can be you that God is lifting out of the muck and mire. Whether it's 90% of your life that you're still living your own way or whether it's that 1% that you're still hanging on to, God can lift you out of that and put you on solid rock. You can begin to build the foundation of Jesus as your cornerstone. Or you can say, no thanks. I have one more song. It's a very short song. It's a very new song.